Well, it's it's end of January. It's supposed yeah, it to should be, be cold. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. This too shall pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we will start in everyone in in less than a minute. We have people who are coming in as we speak. We we will start this webinar in maybe thirty seconds at this point, or even now, Tom. It's Turn the stopwatch two. on. So let's all right. <laughs> well, we'll get going. So. Uh, welcome to the webinar hosted by Catholic Investment Services. Thank you for joining us for the second in a series of mission and focus programs. Today, we discuss the inspiring and courageous work of Catholic Relief Services. My name is Tom Langto, and I'm privileged to serve as Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Investment Services. Uh, Catholic Investment Services was founded by some of the investment industry's most respected leaders to address the investment challenges faced by Catholic organizations. We are a Catholic nonprofit providing investment solutions for other Catholic nonprofits and their investment consultants, and now manage over $1 billion of client assets in four different strategies. My colleague, Zayla Estargian, has done a great job organizing this program and is at the Zoom control panel. Uh, enormous thanks to our panelists who will, uh, you'll meet shortly. Today's format will be conversational, and CIS trustee Paul Stevens will be the moderator. There'll be time for audience questions during and after the formal part of the program, so please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen to submit a question. Our audience is muted. The program is being recorded and will be available for replay on our CIS Institute webpage and in podcast format. You receive biographical information for two of our participants, but I want to emphasize a few highlights. Paul Stevens is a trustee of Catholic Investment Services, but as importantly, served for many years as the Investment Committee Chair for the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, and continues to serve as a fiduciary for several other noteworthy Catholic organizations, including Catholic Distance University and Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington. Before his distinguished career as the Chief Executive Officer of the Investment Company Institute in Washington, and in private law practice, Paul served in senior positions in the White House and Department of Defense during the Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations and received the Department of Defense's highest civilian honor. Jennifer Poitots is Vice President for Humanitarian Response at Catholic Relief Services. When Zayla, Paul, and I uh, last spoke to Jennifer in early January, she was on the ground in Afghanistan. Only the latest episode, an incredible career bringing humanitarian relief to disaster affected populations in the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. Today, she joins us from Paris, and I know that you will be deeply impressed by her humble humanity and intrepid spirit. We're also fortunate to have James Bond, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Catholic Relief Services join us today. James is responsible for all aspects of the financial stewardship of one of the world's largest development and relief agencies. I'm going to turn it over to Paul, who's going to offer a short prayer before the program starts. Paul? Thank you, Tom. Uh, for the prayer to begin our webinar, I've, I've turned to a, a volume of prayers that had been compiled by the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, and so let us join together in the presence of God. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, the privilege is ours to share in the loving, healing, reconciling mission of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in this age and wherever we are, since without you we can do no good thing. May your Spirit make us wise. May your Spirit guide us. May your Spirit renew us. May your Spirit strengthen us. Amen. So, Jennifer and James, thank you very much for uh, being a part of this conversation. Um, um, I really have uh, looked forward to the opportunity through you of acquainting, uh, acquainting a larger Catholic audience of the important work that Catholic Relief Services does. Um, but let me start before we get into the organization by asking you briefly just to say, how is it that you personally were drawn into CRS and its work? Jennifer? Great, and, and thanks so much uh, for, for having this opportunity to, to speak with you all. Um, yeah, so how, why, why CRS for me? I was actually, um, it was when I was in uh, undergraduate 
school at, at the University of Vermont. And I knew I wanted to study, I was studying international nutrition. Um, and, and I've always wanted to, to travel and see other cultures and, and contexts, but I didn't want to be a tourist. Um, and, and I also, yeah, had a desire to, to, to work with, with those who, um, yeah, maybe were at their worst of times, um, but also, you know, at their best of times, because that's when they show how resilient we all are. Um, and, and so I actually joined the Peace Corps to start with. And when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I didn't know it. Um, all I knew was I was weighing 800 babies a month, um, but it was actually a CRS program. Um, so it kind of all started from there. And, and yeah, here I am now. <laughs> James, what about you? Um, for me, I, I came to CRS much later in, in my life and my career. I spent most of my uh, early career in media and, and uh, entertainment industry. And um, it was really um, at a point about five years ago where I was looking to do something uh, more meaningful and, and more uh, connected to my, my Catholic faith, but also in my desire to, to um, improve lives of, of people around the world. And um, I had known about CRS, but uh, this opportunity came up um, and it really was for me uh, a calling to, to serve out my, uh, my faith, but also to work with an incredible organization that's doing uh, great work around the world. So I've been very fortunate to join and, and learn from colleagues like Jennifer who, who've been doing this work for a long time. Well, you know, it occurs to me that you're both uh, custodians of a, of a great legacy in your roles at Catholic Relief Services. And so perhaps we could turn to something about the history of the organization. How did it come into being? What, what were the circumstances and, and how would you trace its, its historic development over the time that it has been a, a part of the, the American Catholic world? Yeah, so, so CRS started um, in 1943. And so actually um, at the end of, of World War II, and we actually, so we celebrated in 2018, 75 years um, for, for CRS. In the beginning, it actually was called War Relief Services, again, because of that link to helping those who were um, affected by, by the war. And it wasn't, I think, believe, until 1955 when the name was changed um, to Catholic Relief Services, and really to take in the context um, that you know we were both an agency that focused on those impacted by crisis, but also focused on longer-term um, development needs, and then really grew from there to our current state, where we're you know we're in over 100 countries on five continents with you know over 7,000. Um, you know, colleagues around the world. And, and I, I think it's important that, yeah, we, we so as opposed to Catholic Charities, CRS only works uh, internationally. Um, and, and yeah, and, and you can, it's really interesting to, to see how CRS evolved when I think, you know, the, the scale of our, our, our programming, which has increased dramatically um, we take Ethiopia, for example, when during the famine, you know, we felt it was a major response when we were reaching 750,000 people. Today, unfortunately, given, you know, the, the, the context in Ethiopia, CRS is assisting more than 6 million people with food assistance just in, just in one country. Was there an individual associated with the founding of what was than war relief services? Uh, is there some? Well, it was the, the, the Bishop's Conference, mm -hmm. um, of course. And, and so, it, you know, it, it, it evolved from there, from the conference. Um, and then, of course, there were, you know, changes in, in leadership over time. But really, you know, CRS is um, an agency of, of the Bishop's Conference and, and governed by, you know, Catholic social teaching and, and the policies of the conference. Um, James, the, the reach of the organization that Jennifer has alluded to is significant. And 
Um, the resources are obviously an extraordinarily important issue for you all. Um, can you describe a little bit about your budget and, and, uh, and sources of revenues and, and uh, um, how you manage? Because the, as, as Jennifer said, the, the, the scale of the challenge never seems to diminish. It just seems to get larger, doesn't it? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. And, you know, as, as we've grown, um, you know, now we're a, an agency uh, of over $1.3 billion in, in activities this year. Um, um, and while, but, but we, we don't measure our success or our, our, our importance by the size of our budget. It's, it, it's about the number of people we're reaching and lives that we're able to save or improve. And so, uh, while financial performance and financial measurement is, is a metric, it's not, it's not the one we're most focused on. Um, and in terms of, our, of that budget, um, you know, we, our, our sources of funding come from a variety, um, a variety of, uh, of partners and participants. We are um, a large implementer of um, U.S. government grants and cooperative agreements, um, working with USAID and, and other U.S. government agencies. We all also work with um, multinational public um, institutions. Um, we are the largest implementing partner for the Global Fund, uh, working on our um, anti-malaria work throughout the world and particularly in, in Africa. Um, but a large portion of our, our funding also comes from private individuals and, and majority of which are, are Catholic uh, individuals. And, and they provide um, really the, the lifeblood of, of funding for us that enables us to invest in, in innovation, um, enables us to be the first responders on the ground when, when disasters strike. Um, and, and we use that, that private uh, funding to be able to leverage funding from institutions and governments to then amplify the work that we do. So, um, the, the contributions of, of private individuals are, are a key component to our overall funding, uh, funding approach. I suspect many American Catholics are well aware of Catholic relief services, but one of the things in the earlier call that we had to prepare for this session that struck me was the variety of partners, um, and including charitable or, or uh, Catholic partners that you have around the world. Could, Jennifer, could, since you've experienced this firsthand, uh, boots on the ground, can you describe that partnership network that CRS is part of? Yeah, and I, I think partnerships are so key to the way CRS works. Um, you know, there's kind of a, a, a growing trend in our sector when you hear people talk about localization and local leadership. Um, but for CRS, this is not a new a new thing. When we, you know, when we look at um, really living uh, Catholic social teaching and, and especially the concept of, of subsidiarity, this is really important um, that we work with, and I, was, and I think it's important to say with local partners, not through local partners, because it's really that partnership and, and, and accompaniment. So we have, um, I think just under 2000 partners globally. Um, and, and many of those are uh, the, lo the, the local Caritas. So CRS is part of Caritas Internationalis, um, which has 165 members. And you know, globally, we are the US member of, of Caritas Internationalis. And many of our, those that we partner with in the countries we work are the, the, the national and diocesan Caritases. And the reason, you know, one is, as James said, you know, we, we want to respond as quickly as possible. Um, and our partners allow us to do that. They also know the context and they have trusted relationships with the communities that we work in, as well as in many cases, like thousands of volunteers, um, which is just amazing and really helps us to, to respond quickly and effectively. Um, so what would you say, um, Jennifer and James, distinguishes CRS in, as a relief organization? Because obviously there are many of them out there. Um, 
Doctors Without Borders is a, is a famous example of that. And they're uh, government relief organizations and the like. But what, what is it that distinguishes in that field Catholic relief services in your mind? Do you want me to jump in, James, and then? Great. Um, so, I mean, I do want to highlight just the last point that James made about the fact that we are fortunate to have private resources and, and that allows us to, to really respond quickly before any public funding comes online. And, and to me, that is a distinguisher for, for CRS. Um, the, other, the other point that I didn't want to raise is that we respond to people's holistic needs. And, and I think this is really critical that, that uh, you know, we often hear, um, you know, of, of housing needs and water needs and um, other, you know, in sectors, but CRS really looks holistically at a response because individuals, you know, their needs are not sectoral, their needs are holistic, and we need to respond in that manner. And I think that really helps us to re respect the, the dignity of the populations that we serve. Um, and, but it also makes our responses more complex uh, because we don't come in with a one size fits all solution. When, for example, when we look at housing, when we were responding to the, the typhoon in Philippines, typhoon Haya, we actually had what we call the menu of options based on people's express needs. So we, we help people to rent, we help people to rebuild, we help people to rehabilitate, uh, we help people to host people who are displaced. And I think that really speaks to um, our ability to really listen and be accountable to the people that we're serving but as well as to come up with solutions that are appropriate for, the, for, the, for that individual context, um, you know, drawing on our experience, but also drawing from, you know, within the expertise of our partners on the ground and within the, the affected community. I can give others, but I'll stick with that one for now. <laughs> so, so do you have an example, Jennifer, of a situation where coming in, uh -huh. you would have thought, here's what's needed. Mm -hmm. Getting there, you learn, no, no, that's not it at all. There's something else here. Yeah, I think the, 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 the shelter example I gave in the Philippines, you know, we kind of often make the assumption that everybody's in a similar situation. Um, you know, their, their house is lost or destroyed and we have to build them a new one. And I think it's important to look at um, that there's actually other options out there. Um, and and also options that include other community members who are open to helping, like the hosting option. I'll give another example from, from Iraq, um, where, you know, uh, during, during the crisis there, um, when there was lots of displacement, um, the, the humanitarian community was really looking at, okay, let's, let's set up camps, you know, for, for displaced persons. Um, which probably sounds to most like, well, that's the obvious solution, right? And, and I think for CRS, what we looked at is, you know, one, the camps are not going to be able to hold those populations. And two, where are the people now? Where are the UZDs? Where the, have they gone to? Where are they staying? And it turns out they were staying in unfinished houses, um, in you know in communities um and were you know felt safe there felt comfortable so what crs did is we went in and we worked with the local officials in those communities the owners um of the houses and we got them to agree that people could stay in those houses we would repair them to the point where you know they had doors and windows Etc. The people themselves would do do some of that work, um, and what that did is it avoided a uh, large number of people going to a camp situation. That, in terms of you know, so people to be in an environment where they felt safe and kind of in a normal living situation it is often not the case in in a camp context. So, it's another example. The, um, the reality in so many different places, and I'm, I'm familiar, for example, with Haiti, uh, 
is it's not a it's not a crisis. It's not a momentary thing. It, it almost spans generations, um, uh, and so the 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 scope of the response it has to be sustained over a considerable period of time. Mm -hmm. um, how does how does Catholic Relief Services think about those kinds of situations? It's it's not like responding to a tsunami or responding to an earthquake or some discrete event. Uh, it's it's a far, far different, uh, it seems to me, order of magnitude challenge. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think more and more, while we are seeing, you know, these protracted crisis situations, I mean, look at Syria, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, I, I, I actually helped start our CRA response that was already in motion in 2013, and so still ongoing. Um, today, uh, Haiti is another perfect example, unfortunately, of you know these kind of long-lasting protracted crisis with with multiple you know factors, both on the natural disaster side, you know earthquakes, floods, etc., um, but also uh, you know political, economic um, issues that are are leading to these crises not not ending. Um, and I think this is where, again, for CRS, you know, we are a dual mandate agency, so we don't stop, um, you know, after people's immediate needs have been met. And we're also there before the crisis starts, right? So we can, we can work both on helping families be better prepared to respond and governments um, and this is a case in, in Haiti where we work on preparedness and disaster risk reduction, both with high-risk communities, but also, you know, with um, the, the local officials under the Department of Civil Protection and helping to do that training of, you know, how to respond and then supporting them through the response. And then hopefully being able to transition people into, you um, you know, early recovery and, and the longer term. But I, I think, you know, that ability to, to work along that continuum that often has, you know, we're looping back, unfortunately, if there's a new incidence. But as we rebuild, um, and we did this in Haiti after the 2011 earthquake and doing now, we also look at how we build back, build back safer, build back better, so the impact is less um, in the future because we know, you know, there was just another earthquake either yesterday or the day before in Haiti, um, and and even apparently yesterday that in Port-au-Prince that sent people running out of our office. So these are things that we're going to have to continue to be prepared for, and and having that dual main, uh, mandate is really helpful uh, for CRS to be really there in the long term with our partners. So James, you, you talked about the fact that you don't necessarily think of the inputs, the financial inputs as, as the appropriate measure. If, if you think about where your board looks at it, your executive leadership looks at it, what are the, the sort of dials on your, on your uh, um, uh, dashboard that you look at most closely when you think about, are we doing what we need to do? Um, you know, that, that's a good question, and I, I think CRS has invested a lot of um, time and resources in our monitoring and evaluation and learning um, as part of our program delivery, and so um, both being able to um, measure and report on the, the impacts that we're able to deliver, but also to continue to refine and innovate our programming so that we can continue to um, deliver innovative and, and life-saving programming. So, um, you know, we, uh, we as an executive leadership team and our, and our, and our board it, have a number of um, key performance indicators. Um, that we're more and more vulnerable and looking at improving livelihoods, uh, um, access to clean water and food, um, and, um, and and employment, youth employment and, and employment for, for women. Um, so those are all some of the areas that we're measuring our, our progress and um, and reporting back to our to our donors on how we're 
uh, how we're working towards those goals. All those sound like extraordinarily important and compelling metrics, um, particularly when you think of it as an American uh, where so many things we take completely for granted are absent um, in, in other parts of our world uh, to people in great, in great need. So, so Jennifer, you, you've had a longer career than James at CRS and you've been on the ground in lots of different places. Um, um, two questions for you. What, what do you think has changed during the period of time that you've been involved in the program? And secondly, what are your reflections about in these many different cultures and places, what are your reflections about the people that you've served? Um, it's got to be in many ways a personally very moving experience, the encounters that you have. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Paul, for those questions. I, I for the first one, I, there's a lot of things that have that have changed, um, and and I would say just first and foremost, the uh, you know, the number and the scale of um, the crisis that you know that we're responding to, and. You know, the UN currently estimates, I think, over 235 million people in need of assistance. Um, I just left Afghanistan, where more than half the country's population is considered to be in need of humanitarian assistance. Um, and so I think one of the changes that I'm really proud of that I've seen at CRS is, and, and it's, not a, it's not an easy one, is how do we scale, right? How do we scale, but to scale um, and to reach more understanding the, the level of need, we not only have to you know, implement more of our own programming with our partners, but we also have to influence others in, in the way they respond, whether that be government, um, whether that be other, uh, other humanitarian organizations, um, so there's been a real kind of push um, to, to scale through influencing others. And that might be, again, like sharing best practices of, you know, building back safer. It might be um, ensuring that our partner staff in, in the Rohingya response in Bangladesh are, you know, have a key role in in coordination. So they're bringing that local expertise and, and influencing coordination and how others respond to, to work on policies for disaster risk reduction um, that are then adopted by um, countries that you know, face recurring disaster. So I think that's really um, a critical change that is important to CRS and I think should be important to, to all to all agencies, because we really have to, um, we have to be making the most of everyone's limited resources, you know, in a context of of, of great need. Um, in terms of the the second question, which I've now forgotten, so you have to tell me. <laughs> no, it, it it that's okay. Um, I, I just was inviting your reflection about these personal encounters you have with people from yeah. vastly different cultures in vastly different personal situations. Mm. Um, there are so many and so varied that it must touch you in a way and, and occasion reflections about, about just the human aspects of what you do. I, I, just, mm. I think uh, our listeners would probably be very interested in hearing, hearing your thoughts on that. Yeah. I think for, for me, it's such, it's such a privilege to do this work. I mean, it's, um, you, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but you're really with people, you know, in, in the worst of times, right? But I think what it does show is how, how resilient we are and, and how much we look out for each other. Um, and you know, I, Ukraine, of course, is on my mind <laughs> these days. And I just remember, um, you know, early in that response, there I was in in Kharkiv, and you know, 
families, families with next to nothing already were hosting other families and people they did not even know, you know? And, and so really that opening of doors to, you know, the stranger and, 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 you know, supporting them in their toughest times, but also seeing the resiliency and, and people, um, and and their ability to to really you know work through these really uh sad and and horrible times and and anything we can do to support them and you know help them maintain their their dignity and some semblance of of normalcy and i think that's where again like when we talk about life saving we talk about you know the typical things like access to safe water, access to healthcare, having a roof over their head um, to, but there, you know, those other things like education, um, that children can continue to go to school. And, and again, we can't wait until they go back home. We have to make sure that school continues um, within these contexts. And you know, there's teachers within displaced and refugee populations, and and I and I think that's giving people that sense of normalcy is just yeah, it makes you <laughs> it makes you feel at the end of the day that you you're doing something right, um, and and so I think that yeah, it, it again it, it's such a, a a privilege to to do this work and, and hopefully do it yeah, the, best, the best that I can. So the name of the organization is Catholic Relief Services. Um, what, what would you, how would you describe the Catholic identity that the organization has and how is it communicated? You know, the, and as Tom said, I'm involved with Catholic Charities here in the Diocese of Arlington. And, and one of the board members, uh, uh, when he was welcoming to me to the board had said, just remember, Paul, we do this not because they are Catholic, that is to say the people we're serving, but because mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a, a wonderful insight into the nature of what Catholic Charities does here in, in my diocese. Mm -hmm. How was that Catholic identity expressed by Catholic Relief Services in this vast international mission you have? Yeah, and, and so similarly, you know, we work in many contexts um, where there's a very small, small, small <laughs> um, uh, Catholic population, um, you know, again, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, the, the list is long, right? Um, but we are there and we're, we, we are present. And I would say, you know, if... If you look at you know you look at Catholic social teaching, you look at um, subsidiarity, stewardship, the common good, sacredness and dignity of of the human person, you see those um, you can see examples in in our work every single day. And this is something you know I was many years a. a before taking this global position, a country representative for, for CRS, um, you know, in India and in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, yeah, the list is long. <laughs> um, but one of the things we often do with our teams is, you know, we reflect on, you know, we we, we have, um, you know, the all the aspects of Catholic social teaching and we kind of reflect on and, and give, you know, have a process of giving examples of how we see those um, teachings living out every day um, in our work. And I, and I think, you know, just looking at, uh, for example, stewardship, when we think about how all the, all the systems and, and, and processes CRS has in place, to make the very best use of, of all the resources, whether it's, you know, as James said, you know, our private resources, uh, um, but, um, as well as those public from many of, um, you know, government donors and foundations and, and corporations, et cetera. And, and, you know, our ability to, to really put systems in place 
to ensure that um, you know our resources are are used to the best of our ability. So you know we have policies and procedures. We have um, you know we look at segregation of of duties within the organization. Um, we preposition. Uh, and, and when I say we preposition, most people think, you know, we have huge warehouses of, of stuff, but we actually also preposition relationships with, um, with vendors, um, with financial service providers, so that we, you know, we know, you know, we're, we're getting quality, timeliness, um, and we can respond quickly. And, and yeah, really making sure that we make the most, the, the most of those those resources and and I think that the dignity um, it also plays out always and I, and I like to always use our example of in in our humanitarian responses of of CRS's growing shift to to use cash and to provide people we call it multi-purpose cash um, that allows people to interact with the market the local market. Um, just as they would, you know, if they were home, right? And they can buy things that they need. Um, you know, we're not giving everybody shoes and, you know, making those assumptions that that's what they need. And they also have, you know, five children and all their feet are different <laughs> sizes. So they can engage with the market, they can get what they need. Um, and it also helps the local market uh, to, to quickly, um, bounce back and rebuild itself, which is also a benefit uh, to others in the community as well. So, so I think, yeah, just a few examples about how our, you know, we see that those aspects of, of Catholic social teaching and every day and, you know, within our actions and our programming and, and, and how the agency is, um, is structured and, and our policies and procedures that guide us. And, and I and I just add to that, um, as as Jennifer mentioned, you know, our Catholic identity and Catholic social teaching is is at the center of, of everything we do, um, and and you know, and some of those principles of subsidiarity and and our and our agency strategy is you know is actually is termed um, in their own hands, and it's really about putting um, these development solutions in the hands of those that are you know, closest to the work and, and those that are the participants in our program really guiding those. And, and what, we, what we find is that in, in countries that we work in, you know, as Jennifer mentioned, we, you know, we work throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, which are, um, you know, the predominant religion is not uh, Catholicism, but we find that um, those, um, those, um, those partners and, and those that we're working with have a shared values with us. And it's really, even if they're not Catholic, you know, it, it is that coming from the shared values that uh, we are able to work effectively with, with groups of, of all faith and uh, institutions of all different um, um, makeups. So I think it's really that our Catholicism is at the root of what we do, but enables us to work with, with everyone. You know, it, it's, a, it's such, a compelling, uh, such a compelling story. Um, and I, I think too often Catholics in the United States and perhaps elsewhere as well don't have as good an understanding as they should about the work that our church does. I uh, was talking to someone recently about the, the Afghan um, refugees and the resettlement here in the United States. Uh, and there's a whole network of organizations of which Catholic Charities in Arlington is one that is accepting Afghan refugees and getting them resettled. And among all the organizations doing that, the group that is at, under the USCCB is the single largest resettlement effort in the United States for those refugees. Now, how many Catholics know that? Um, how many Catholics know the story uh, of, of CRS? And, you know, we could go through one example after another, but in the earlier conversations, uh, Jennifer was talking about the work they're doing in Tonga, which just had that terrible volcano, undersea volcano. The, the contingency and other preparations in case there's an expanded war in, 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 in Central Europe. Um, it, there's no place, I think, uh, where there is a need that you won't find uh, Catholic Charities and its partners. Um, uh, and that's a story that needs, I think, to get out. It's one of the real reasons that 
CIS was so excited about doing this to showcase what you were up to. So Jennifer, when you get some time off, I think you ought to go on a lecture tour um, across the United States. Uh, that, that's a serious suggestion too. But James, I'd, I'd like to know how, how is it, that, again, at your board and senior management level, you communicate this? Um, um, because it, it would seem to me that's a, there's an urgent need for it, not only to advance your mission, but also so that those of us who support the work and, and, and mission of our church um, should be taking such great pride and, and offering great support for everything that you're doing in our name uh, to the, the neediest around the world. Uh, you're you're absolutely right, Paul. Um, we do have a, a a group in the U.S. that works. Um, you know, part of our mission is to um, is to deepen understanding of of our work and connecting with U.S. Catholics so that they can live out um, their um, uh, their Catholic faith. Um, we work very closely with dioceses throughout the, the United States with um, with Catholic universities and schools. Um, with organizations within other schools and universities that are um, that are composed of, you know, uh, Catholics who, who want to live out their their faith, and um, you know, we really see this as an important part of amplifying uh, the work that we do, and um, and also providing opportunities for for Catholics in the U.S. to um, to, to connect and serve with their uh, their brothers and sisters overseas. Um, we're working on something called a movement building in the U.S. and really building up some grassroots um, um, support for CRS and our work and so that people uh, throughout the United States um, can be advocates for our work and can, um, can, be, uh, can help us to raise up the work that we're doing and, and, and raise up resources um, for, for us to be able to continue this, this growing need overseas. Well, that's excellent. Keep keep that up for sure. And I see uh, I see Zayla has now come onto the screen. Do you, do you want to uh, start into Q and A, Zayla? Yes, definitely. We have so many great questions. And by the way, this is such a nice discussion. And we're really enjoying every minute of it. So um, I'm going to start with a question from Pat Deneen, who's a board member at CRS. And this question is directed towards James and Jennifer, and she's asking. Uh, you to elaborate on how CRS is using impact investing initiatives to transform some of your programs to investments, how, how you're supplementing CRS funds with private funds. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one, Jennifer, and thank you, Pat. And Pat is, uh, is, is a very humble member of our, our, our board and our investment committee and has been a huge supporter uh, for CRS and, and really helped us form um, and develop our approach to using and bringing private capital to, to, to long-term sustainable development solutions. And, and as Pat mentioned, um, you know, part of how we're doing that is, um, is allocating some of our investment reserve funds towards impact funds. And so we have a number of investments that, that we've made where we're looking to put our investment capital to, to work uh, to drive impact. Um, we also have, have developed a, a, a two impact uh, investment vehicles that we're using to bring development um, uh, solutions to water access in Central America, um, as well as improving livelihoods of smallholder farmers in, in Central America. And, and those blended finance vehicles um, bring a combination of um, investment capital and technical assistance to be able to uh, improve water access and improve li livelihoods. Um, we are also, um, at, we're, we're very um, excited to see the USCCB um, updated socially responsible investing guidelines and specific call outs in those guidelines for Catholic uh, investors to direct more of their capital towards impact investments that can deliver both uh, financial returns, but also social and economic benefits. So um, we're looking to continue to build our work in that area and be a leader within uh, among Catholic uh, institutions in that area. That's that's great, thank you. And and you, you're you also making, you joined our 
private equity and Catholic impact funds. So thank you for that. That's a great step in the right direction. Um, speaking of water, um, we have a question about how climate change has impacted your work. Jennifer, do you want to start? Uh, thanks. <laughs> sure. I, I, unfortunately, yeah, climate change is 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 real, and and I think having an enormous impact. Um, again, on the frequency and um, intensity of the natural disasters that we're seeing uh, globally, and and what it again. So what it means is, you know more people at risk of displacement, more people actually being um, displaced, um, and then, you know, losing losing their homes, losing their assets uh, along with that. So I think for us, one of the big areas that we focus on um, as it relates to, to, to climate change and the impacts of climate change is our programming in disaster risk reduction and really, um, helping communities identify how they can um, build their resilience um, to, you know, to disasters and what types of things they can do at the community level um, to reduce their vulnerability. And, and I think that's, you know, and, and then also be prepared to respond. And in that response, be prepared already have identified who are the people most vulnerable in this in their communities to ensure that their safety and security um, is is addressed. So I think the you know we've always talked about it's it's much, much easier um, and much more cost effective and saves lives to focus on preparedness um, and disaster risk reduction. Um, but it's still a really hard sell with donors, unfortunately, but I think the climate change discussion is just bringing that up even more and more, the importance of that, helping prepare, helping communities prepare for disasters and, and put actions in place to, to mitigate the impact. Wonderful. I am um, continuing on that topic. So we have a question from Tim Connors. We have, he's saying there are so many new technologies emerging to help the vulnerable. For instance, drone delivery of medical supplies, broadband um, anywhere in the world, and um, also dignified housing. And he says he'd love to hear from you about a few examples of how CRS is using technology creatively to help your clients. Great. I will. Uh, I'll give a. I'll give a couple examples linked to our our cash assistance. Um, so CRS uses uh, electronic cash transfers, and and this is really beneficial in um, humanitarian context, in that we are able to, um, in the event that you know we lose access due to conflict or, or other issues, our programming can continue. So in places like Northeast Nigeria, um, in the Anglophone crisis in, in Cameroon, um, we are ensuring that people have access to cash using this, this technology of um, electronic transfers um, in areas that you know, are highly volatile. Um, and then on the on the monitoring side, by using this technology, even though we can't be present at all times, we can see in real time what people are purchasing, um, and and so we can see how they're using the cash um, because there's a connection through this technology to to the vendors. We can see what's being sold, you know, how much it's being sold for to be sure that there's not issues of you know giving the wrong prices um, and and then we can you know we can also really have a look at yeah what people's needs are and what they're using resources for and the other benefit of this is again in these really um, vulnerable contexts 
we can actually support really small vendors um, to keep their businesses open um, and through using using this technology and 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 invo involving small vendors as opposed to you know bringing in large shipments of food um, uh, that are is often difficult because you you know you can't get into these context and again it supports the local market so that's one example we also do um in in many of our responses again it depends on the context and, and you know uh, we look at security as well um you know we do use drones for mapping um especially ma mapping um you know communities damages to households and that that informs our programming um, of course, we can only do that in context where it's, you know, safe to be using that type of technology and doesn't raise uh, security issues um, for our teams and the communities on the ground, but, but we definitely make use of that as well. A few examples. Oh, that's wonderful. I uh, love technological advances. Um, so we have impact related questions uh, coming in. Uh, are your program goals and monitored results being compared to the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs? And um, I don't know, maybe James, you might wanna start answering that or? Um, I think Jennifer is probably better positioned, but I'll say that, you know, we have a, uh, our agency strategy is, uh, um, that, I, that I referenced is, it's called a Vision 2030 strategy. And um, it is, you know, designed, it, particularly in mind to, to, for alignment with the UN SDGs and their targets for 2030. Um, our major goal areas um, are, are aligned with specific um, sustainable development goals of, of the UN and, and our measurement of, of impact and, and progress to those goals are aligned with what um, the UN SDGs are, but perhaps Jennifer can provide other context or, or input. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely, you know, we, of course, have our own targets um, that, that Sierra sets again, as James mentioned, you know, under our 2030 strategy um, and in the different areas. Um, so, for example, when we, you know, when we look at um, our, you know, the emergency part of our strategy, you know, Sierra aims to, to reach um, more than 10 million people with housing either directly or indirectly, safe and dignified housing. Um, we aim to distribute over a billion dollars in, in cash assistance. We aim to reach over 200,000 um, 200, children um, with access to quality education and, and psychosocial support. So, so we have our own targets that, that CRS has set. Um, but they're definitely um, aligned with um, different SDG, SDGs, um, but those are that are measured and tracked individually at, at the agency level. Um, yeah. So um, there's a question about uh, whether you work with a Jesuit Volunteer Corps, because I, I think you mentioned AmeriCorps and they were wondering if um, that's another organization that you've worked with. Yes, so we often partner with um, or work really closely with Jesuit refugee services um, in our humanitarian work. Um, but again, we have yeah over 2000 <laughs> local partners, local and, and international partners. Um, in terms of volunteers, for the most part, um, volunteers are volunteers from the country uh, that we work in and volunteers of our local partners. So, so, and most, and that's our priority um, because again, those are volunteers who are from the country, know the language, know the context um, and, and are linked to our, our local Caritas partner. Um, and yeah, and really are one of the key ways in which we can respond quickly and effectively. Thank you, Jennifer. I have a, I have a question for you because uh, when we were doing our prep call, you were in uh, Afghanistan, you were in Herat, and and all I was thinking as a woman, uh, how did you feel about 
being there during this time as compared to like eight months ago, let's say before we left uh, mm-hmm. Afghanistan in August. And, and in general, how do you feel about your safety being an American citizen? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Afghanistan is certainly, um, you know, an, an amazing country with, with amazing people who are in a, in a very difficult uh, and I, to put it, yeah, that's not even the right word, but uh, situation. And and as mentioned, you know, half the population in need of humanitarian assistance. And you know, if if there's not a solution soon um, to the liquidity crisis, to the 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 sanctions, and to and and the need to get. Um, the the public sector and public services back on track. Um, we are we are just heading for you know we are spiraling into a, a an even worse situation. For for as you can yeah as you can imagine Zayla for women in Afghanistan, you know this is again uh, just an especially concerning and and troublesome time and and. You know, as a as someone who can go and then you know leave, of course, I can I can only just from my discussions with our, our female colleagues in Afghanistan, just you know feeling that that tension and stress um, for them. Given you know we have seen some positive signs in terms of you know the the schools for young children are back open with girls and boys going to school. Um, you know, women. You know, women are working, are are able to work in some places and in, and in, and and some professions. You know, for NGOs, our, our female staff are back in the office. They can go to the field. Um, you know, female teachers. But then, on the other hand, that's not the case. That's not consistent across across the country. Um, and older girls are, are not being, you know, are not able to go back to school yet. And of course, you can imagine how parents are, are, are just trying to figure out what to do and, and you know, mothers of, of girls and, 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 you know, and thinking is our only choice to leave the country. So, you know, our daughter can continue our education. So really, really um, challenging and, and difficult times. Um, you know, unfortunately, we we experience um, really good access to the communities that we work in. Um, you know, CRS is very serious about the safety and security and the well-being of our staff, and we do all we can to keep our staff safe. Um, and in this context, looking at the particular security risks to our female staff. Um, but that's something that's like constantly on our minds, um, and that we're constantly, you know, checking in with our female staff to see, do they feel comfortable? Do they feel comfortable going to the field? Um, and what we can do to ensure that their, you know, their safety and security, but it is an extremely concerning time. We want to see, you know, we want to see what the, the, you know, the government is saying in terms of ensuring that women can be at work, ensuring that they, um, you know, girls can go to school. We need to see that happening in in real life um, and soon, um, because otherwise, yeah, the people, you know, people will start making decisions um, that may not be the ones they want to make. You know they love their country. They want to stay there. They want their children to grow up there. But it's it's a really difficult context right now. Jennifer, just be assured that you and your organization, and most especially the people that you serve around the world, will very much be in all of our prayers. Thank you. So, Paul, thank you for being a again an outstanding moderator of one of our programs and. Uh, Jennifer and James, uh, I don't think we could have had two better, more more authentic or more inspirational representatives of CRS than the two of you. And it's just, it's a, it's a uh, incredible story that you tell. And we're, 
I'm humbled and I'm an old cynical guy and I'm, I'm humbled by <laughs> w- what you do and the, and the way you do it. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. We've got a little survey at the end of the call. If you take the time to fill it out, it'd be very helpful to us for future uh, sessions. But uh, again, thank you to our panel, uh, a really remarkable program and uh, hope all of our uh, participants uh, will be, uh, uh, continue to be healthy and safe. Thank you very much. Jennifer, James, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. For all you, you do. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.